Many people love the sound of a V8 engine. It conveys power and reliability. But car makers try to sell you a turbocharged inline four, saying it's comparable. Or if you want more, they offer you a hybrid. But if you think a turbo inline four and V8 are the same, you'd be duped. And if you want to blame the car maker, then you're wrong. It's the EPA. Today, we'll see why. Imagine you're looking to buy a new car and your top priority is not performance, but fuel economy. After researching a few models, you decide on a car with a high published EPA rating. But after a month of use and driving around town, you realize you're only getting a meager 24 miles per gallon on average. And you wonder, what happened to the promised 30 miles per gallon on highway and 28 miles per gallon combined? And you wouldn't be alone to wonder that. A lot of car and truck owners have complained about the gap between the fuel efficiency they thought they'd get and what they actually get on the road. This leads many to wonder where the promised fuel economy is and whether it's a deliberate deception. Before any car maker can put a model out on the market, it must first get approval from the EPA. Did you know that since the late 1970s, the EPA has certified fuel economy projections for some 450 million new cars sold in the U.S.? The fuel efficiency projections that you see on the window stickers of new cars and trucks are there by law. For example, you might see city miles per gallon 16 and highway miles per gallon 25. Of course, when you see those numbers, they're boldly displayed and appear very official. That's because they're coming from the federal government, which gives it a lot of credibility. After all, the EPA figures determine whether an automaker is meeting their required average fuel economy specifications for the company's entire vehicle line, so these numbers are very important. They're important for us as consumers as well, because fuel efficiency is high on the list of things that new car buyers want. So I think this is also a matter of trust guess how many employees work for the EPA and how many of them actually test cars. The common view is that the federal agency is working diligently to test every new truck, car, van, and SUV model. But in reality, for the most part, it doesn't conduct tests on its own. That's because it simply doesn't have the budget, equipment, or manpower to test hundreds of individual models, each with its own unique engine and transmission combinations. Surprisingly, only 18 of the EPA's 17,000 plus employees work in the automotive testing department, which is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. These 18 employees analyze roughly 200 to 250 vehicles a year and research about 15% of new models. As for the remaining 85%, the EPA allows each automaker to test their own vehicles and submit their test results. The agency takes the figures provided by each individual car company as factual without any further testing, and they approve the numbers that we end up with seeing on the window sticker. And that's why we see their stamp of approval in the words assessed by the EPA. This is one reason why why actual mileage may differ from what you see in advertisements in the window sticker. Is the automaker interested in making the reported miles per gallon different from the actual mileage? In a way, yes. When a car falls into the category of gas guzzler, that is below 22 and a half miles per gallon, or when a brand's entire lineup falls short of the government's fuel economy regulations, then someone has to pay literally. That's because it's the law. We can thank the Energy Act of 1978, which introduced what many call the gas guzzler tax. This tax is added to the sticker price, although it does not apply to trucks. So, for example, the smallest fine a new car buyer will pay for the low fuel economy of a particular car can be a thousand bucks. That's the line applied on a Mercedes-Benz S550 with its 14 miles per gallon city and 22 miles per gallon highway. The car with the worst fuel economy is a Lamborghini Murcielago that gets just eight miles a gallon city, 13 on the highway for a combined 10 miles per gallon. For this excess, the buyer pays a fine of $6,400, but the maximum penalty can go up to $7,700 for a car. So it's not surprising since 1983, nearly $800 million in fines have been collected by the IRS from new car buyers. Car makers also have to pay if the fuel economy figures don't meet the standards set by the corporate average fuel economy regulations. These regulations were also set in 1978 and apply to the entire vehicle fleet. Since the 2009 model year, it was officially agreed that automakers should meet an average of 27.5 miles per gallon for passenger cars and 23.1 miles per gallon for light trucks. Car fleets are divided into three categories, domestic cars, imported cars, and light trucks. And each individual category must meet the requirements for fuel economy. If any automaker fails to reach its mark, it'll be fined $5.50 times each 0.1 miles per gallon under the threshold times the number of cars sold. This is why, for example, Ferrari paid $616 bucks for each of its 1,645 vehicles sold in 2008, which amounted to over a million dollars a year in fines. So as you can see, manufacturers also have to pay too. 
Of course, to keep the industry honest, the EPA does spot checks each year. Remarkably, the agency says its own test results are almost always very close to those of the automakers. But what happens when the agency and the automaker's performance tests differ? According to the rules, the EPA retests the vehicle to evaluate the performance of the automaker. Fuel economy should be within three percentage points. Otherwise, the automaker must accept the smaller of the two sets of numbers or request another retest. But there are other reasons that can explain the differences in fuel economy estimates. The fact is that the real world, there are so many different variables that impact fuel economy like driving conditions, behaviors, and so forth. Absolute accurate miles per gallon simply is not possible. As a result, in 2008, the EPA updated its testing protocols, taking into account that real life driving has more stops, starts, accelerates, and decelerates, and tends to be more aggressive and faster on the highway and so on. So while there's a marginal difference, it does seem that EPA and real world average fuel economy figures are much closer than ever before. So how does the EPA testing lab work? The EPA system was modified in 1984 and also in 2008 to make it more relevant. Even though it still doesn't precisely reflect real world driving, the EPA continues to use dynamometer based stationary laboratory tests to ensure repeatability. You can think of the dynamometer or dyno as a giant treadmill for cars. The vehicle is held stationary while the wheels are turning large rollers on a chassis dynamometer. There are three such stands, one of which is an all wheel drive unit with sets of rollers for both front and rear wheels. While the other two dynos are rotated only by the drive wheels of the car, either front wheel or rear wheel. Once the vehicle is secured to the dyno, personnel enter values and figures to simulate real world factors such as wind and friction on the road. The EPA fuel economy test has certain parameters to follow. Then one of the EPA's six experienced drivers will get behind the wheel to drive the test car. The driver has to precisely follow a red line of speed against time which is displayed on the monitor hanging directly in front of the windshield. The driver does his best to match the red line with the car's wheel speed. Actually, it's much more difficult than you think. If the speed deviates from the test cycle by more than two miles an hour, the results don't get counted and you have to start over. There is a crazy high number of documents that explains each procedure and circumstance in detail, each with its own set of rules. Even the process of rounding off fuel economy test results that gets published on a new car sticker label is unbelievably complicated. But this is what the EPA does on their end to get the most accurate miles per gallon rating they can on a dynamometer. A key element of the EPA's estimated average fuel economy is the separation between city and highway driving. Almost all cars and trucks provide better fuel economy when driving at 55 miles on an open highway as opposed to stop and go traffic on city streets. When it comes to calculating the combined miles per gallon, the EPA assumes that motorists drive 55% of the time in the city and 45% of the time on the highway. That's the benchmark they use. But of course, in the real world, if you live in a large city, you'll likely spend more time in the city than 55%. Even if you spend a lot of time driving on a highway, it's only considered highway if your average speed is 50 miles per hour and up. Try doing that in rush hour traffic in Houston. It's impossible. If you're at crawl on a traffic on the highway at a speed of 10 miles an hour, then your fuel consumption will be closer to city than highway. So if you're diligently keeping track of the number of miles you travel based on the agency's MPG rating, it'll be hard not to be disappointed. You can't simply add their numbers to your own driving habits. Honestly, assessing your particular situation is the only way to accept EPA rating differences or simply change your driving style to match it. Then your car's odometer will more accurately reflect the fuel economy. Now there are six factors that studies estimate could cause a car's actual fuel economy to differ significantly from the EPA rating. The first factor is the amount of city driving you do. Driving with frequent starts and stops can reduce the EPA combined by city and highway fuel efficiency by as much as 27%. Second, your driving style can reduce fuel efficiency by up to 18%. Studies show that calm drivers benefit from 35% better fuel economy than over aggressive drivers. A third factor that impacts fuel economy is the use of an air conditioner. Turning it on continuously results in a fuel efficiency reduction of up to 14% on older cars. Fourth, the size of your car also plays a role. It can reduce mileage by up to 15%. A fifth reason has to do with your region and climate. For example, environments with hot weather and mountainous conditions can reduce fuel efficiency by as much as 12%. And the last thing that can cause the real mileage to differ from EPA is if you're constantly carrying heavy loads or passengers. 
years. So take all that into mind before you jump to the conclusion that the EPA rating is completely off. By the way, another thing to consider is the type of fuel you're using, which can affect the fuel economy. For example, the EPA conducts a test with 100% gasoline in the tank, but most U.S. gasoline contains 8 to 10% ethanol. This ethanol is used to increase the amount of oxygen in the gasoline and to provide better fuel combustion, but it alone can reduce fuel efficiency by about 2%, which might sound little, but when you couple that with some of the other factors, it can all add up. Now imagine that if you check box for two, maybe three, or even more of these six factors that reduce fuel economy. The next question probably is, why can't the agency take these nuances into account when testing cars? The short answer is that it's simply not possible. It's impossible to know what percentage of drivers in which terrain will have aggressive driving patterns in order to accurately calculate this figure. It's also not possible to calculate exactly where every particular vehicles are driven the most and how often the air conditioner is on and so on. Also, remember that most of the time, although automakers conduct their tests with the agency's test protocols, the final fuel efficiency figures are provided by the automaker themselves and not the EPA. So now you tell me what do you think of the EPA ratings now that you know all this and do you keep track of your miles per gallon and if you have a funnier horror story about fuel economy please share by commenting below. As always if you like this video please like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for your support.